You ever seen the Radiohead video for the song Just? There's a guy lying on the floor and he won't get up. And everyone's like, why? What are you doing? Get up, silly. And then he says, I'm here because I know something. I can't tell you because you won't want to know. I'm doing it for your sake. Yeah, well, that guy's like me in bed now. With all those people asking him, tell us, tell us now. Well, that's all of you. And then he tells them and the final shot pans over all of them just laying on the floor. And that's what you'll be doing by the end of this video. Sorry about that. I'm Marcus Welsh and I use books, articles, websites and your emails to investigate, discuss and go on adventures. Well, I'm just going to be in bed now, so please look and subscribe. So I'm going to tell you now how I know we're all living in a simulation, and soon we'll all just be lying in bed, day after day, knowing we're just bits of data on a motherboard of uselessness. Every nice meal is just binary code, every choice pre-coded, pre-loaded life continues. However, is there a way of getting out of it? So I read this article on Scientific American. Do we live in a simulation? Chances are about 50-50. So using probability theory, which I'm not even going to try and understand, but a few clever people have popped some data into a theorem and come up with a probability of around 50-50. So there's half a chance we could be living in a simulation and half a chance that the reality we experience now is actually real, whatever that means. So first up, what does living in a simulation actually mean? Help! <laughs> well, let's take two assumptions. One, the Fermi paradox states that the probability of what we call alien life is certain, but the paradox is we haven't found it yet. So it could be that alien life is real, advanced, and simulating a reality similar to their own universe, but with only us and our simulated Earth inside it. Or two, the fact that our future selves might well be simulating our past selves. Realistically, soon enough, quantum computing will negate Moore's law. Moore's law refers to the perception that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years, though the cost of computers is halved. The law states that we can expect the speed and capability of our computers to increase every couple of years, and we will pay less for them, which has very much come true. But it has a ceiling, a point where that rate of growth slows down and ends, when we're unable to develop chips with smaller and more numerous transistors. And therefore, it's not a ridiculous assumption to assume that future humans' computing power will be advanced enough to simulate our reality. I mean, look at these two video games. They're 34 years apart. I look at this child there and this idiot man. That's 34 years apart. Computing progress is outstanding. Think of it like your favorite RPG. You think that villager looks interesting, I'll go and see what she has to say. And you input those commands through your controller. It may not be that someone is controlling our movements at all times, but those same commands have been inputted into us somehow. So next time you speak to someone, think, someone may have pushed A before I did this. Glitches simulation. Maybe you're thinking of The Matrix? We hold The Matrix in high regard as some reality-busting film. Glitches in The Matrix, people say. Take the red pill to wake up, some people say. And there's also Plato's Allegory of the Cave, an oversighted thought experiment from Plato's Republic. It deals with the very question of reality. Put basically, people are tied up in a cave, with their heads forever facing forward, watching a wall where shadows of life are being cast. These people see humans, animals and events as mere shadows. One day, one of the cave dwellers breaks free, steps out the cave and experiences reality for the first time. It's like life and reality now exist in different planes. When they go back and tell and try to free the others, they refute the suggestion and do not want to hear it. I certainly appreciate this thought experiment for what it says about the human psyche. We live in our own bubbles, and when we hear of how lovely another bubble is, all our worst emotions cloud us until we see that other bubble how we want, before we actually explore what it really has to offer. So what does the cave mean? Is our life now the shadows? And when and how can we escape the cave and experience that higher level of reality? The question can be debated and is debated over and over, but to me it's pretty futile. 
it's actually quite arrogant. In Plato's Cave of Life, we're not even the shadow projections. We're the wall that life is projected onto. A flat shape of antimatter. And not as in antimatter, as in matter made of antiparticles, but as in matter we don't. The Matrix, Plato's Cave, whatever, a simulation is far less personal. It knows you're a bunch of numbers existing for fractions of a second in the simulation's real time. Once your time is done, the mouse hovers over you, drags you into a different folder, and then hovers above empty recycle bin. And that single click of OK is the final nail in your coffin. A computer glitch is defined as an error that occurs within a computer system that causes it to malfunction whilst processing data. The most common computing errors are caused by issues within the operating system itself. Have you ever felt like you glitched? Or have you seen a glitch occur in front of you? There are plenty of examples online of real life glitches, which are supposed to show things, mainly people, accidentally being processed more than once. But really they're just fun Photoshop images. But they do make us feel something for a reason. We humans like to see patterns in every object. We do it all the time in clouds, photos, on our walls, our ceilings. Do you remember your childhood wallpaper? That used to change every night, didn't it? Maybe it even moved for you too. I want to play a Beatles song now. I'm so tired, but it's going to be played backwards. For those looking for clues to back up the Paul is Dead conspiracy, found a hidden message in this song. Can you hear it? Did you hear it? What you're listening out for is Paul is dead man. Miss him. Miss him. I'll play it again. And did you hear it that time? So we can try and delve into why the human psyche looks for patterns, but the human psyche again is irrelevant here. This whole pattern searching property we have makes sense in simulation theory. It's maybe the one thing we're actually getting right. We are a pattern. Think of 2D pixelated Mario. Every pixel that makes us up is forming a pattern. And the same is true for everything out there. We are right to perceive all sorts of patterns in clouds, because that's all the cloud is. A palette of pixels. And us and everything we see is all made of the same stuff. But back to those funny Photoshop glitches. The reason I don't think this type of scenario would actually be possible is because a simulation wouldn't overuse its processing power. It has such a massive task already that to save power it must only simulate what is required. Therefore any real glitch wouldn't be, say, three of the same person in a row. It'd be no person at all. So you're you, right? And I'm me. But how do you know I'm me? Because you're you and you, kn you know you're you. So that's the only reliable information you have here. And that's based on the fact that I know I'm me. And that's all we can really say for certain. So say we didn't know each other and you just passed me on the street. Total strangers to each other. How do you know that I haven't been simulated? As the programme thinks and predicts that for this day to seem normal, a couple of people would need to walk past. It doesn't need to do much. Simulate a human walk. Easy, done that before. A face? Fine, no problem. Needs to fit the form of a human face but be generated slightly randomly. It's okay, I can look like a combination of other people throughout history. Just mash it together. You don't ever have to see me again. I'm generated for that one purpose. And then as soon as you turn a corner, I'm gone. So why do we have units? The world is full of units. Speed, distance, time, energy, light, etc. They are rules of this simulation, that's why. So surely we can break the simulation if we can break the rules. Well we can't. So far we can't seem to go small enough to find code or pixels, or big enough or fast enough to outpace the speed of light. It's possible though if we do manage to outpace the speed of light, the simulation can't simulate fast enough and it will just come crashing down on itself. This world really does seem full of fates, choices and paths we can go down. You could be doing many things right now, but you're choosing watching this, as I was choosing to make this for you to watch. 
This is our current reality as we speak at this second. But the whole backlog of coincidence for us to be here now really does need examining. <laughs> Every choice we make leads to the next choice. That's all life is, a series of choices linked up together like a chain. Every choice one of your ancestors made led to them meeting so the next generation could exist. What are the odds? And I don't mean the odds of a chance meeting. I mean the odds of every decision everyone ever made for the last 3.5 billion years to lead to you. This is determinism. It states that everything we do as a choice of free will is actually a hardwired, predetermined process that goes on in your brain. The equation is belief plus desires plus temperament equals action. So let's work it out with this carrot. My belief is that this is a pretty nice carrot. I'm hungry, so that will satisfy my current desire and my temperament for healthy food have led to this action. All right then, you're saying, use some free will. Hit your dog with the carrot. Okay, this may seem like a choice of free will to suddenly hit my dog, but we can still plug it into the determinist equation. I believe booping the puppy on the nose will be fun. I desire to make her happy so she can play and have some carrot after, and my temperament ensures I only hit her gently. So what you're saying now is real free will would be to hit her really hard with the carrot. Something I just won't do, just as you won't do it. I mean, prove me wrong. Go and kick your cat out the window. You can't do it unless you have the temperament for it, which I bet you don't. Most of us don't. Please don't actually do that. Experiment time. I'm going to count to 10. And at one point, I want you to shout, I'm a banana. And remember what number you decided to shout it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What number did you decide? Wrong, actually. You didn't decide at all. In the 1980s, Benjamin Liebeck conducted an experiment. Subjects were hooked up to a brain scanner and asked to flex their wrists whenever they wanted to. At the same time, they watched a clock and recorded the exact time which they made their decision to flex. What Libet found is that the test subjects reported that they made a decision to flex, on average, about 0.15 seconds before their muscles actually did the flexing. However, their brain showed signs of ramping up to flex, on average, about 0.55 seconds before their muscles flexed. In conclusion, the brain shows signs of producing muscle motion about 0.4 seconds before we report that we're aware of having made a decision to move our muscles. Does that mean we have every decision coded into us? Every choice we ever make in our own free will is just the predetermined choices and paths set out in our simulations coding. It's not like we don't already simulate worlds. Probably my favourite game ever is Roller Coaster Tycoon, a theme park simulator released in 1999. The game rewards you for making people happy, giving them a good time. But you're God on this game, and you can do what you want within the gameplay mechanics. You can actually build a roller coaster designed to crash. Here's mine. I'm setting the launch speed to max, so when my patrons get on, they'll launch off here into their fiery, fiery deaths. But are there actually moral implications to what I'm doing now? Do I have a responsibility for these bits of code about to ride to their death? Are there actual ethical implications in my killing of a character whose purpose on the game is to not be killed? Well, there you go. As you can see, I think no. This game's a set of commands, and one of the possible options is that these people can die in a roller coaster crash. However, does the sophistication of modern and future gaming raise a greater ethical point when it comes to characters using adaptive learning? Adaptive or reinforcement learning means future characters in video games will know what is right and wrong once they have been presented enough of a stimulus either way. As a comparison on a more sophisticated level, it's the same way that my dog will paw because she knows she gets a carrot and will be furious with me if she does the poor action and doesn't get one. 
Now, let's put that into a future game. Say every time a character on our side killed one of the baddies and came up to us and we gave them money every time, they'd keep doing it. But what if they killed one of the baddies, came up to us and we shot them in the foot? How guilty would you feel then? And this may seem crazy until you relate it to our current simulated world. If we are being controlled, there seems to be a lot of suffering out there, right? Climate change, homicide, inequality, famine, greed, racism, sexism. I could go on. Who, who or what is making the decision to give us these things? To put these things on our earth with us? And what is their moral responsibility to us? And when I put it that way, I think I'll build these people another toilet. Yeah, 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 get on with it. Tell us how you know the universe is a simulation. Sure thing. Let me present to you the Ed Sheeran paradox. So as far as I can see, our lives run on this equation. Stimulus equals emotional reaction. We have an emotional reaction to everything. Even if it's something that bores you so much you can't deal with it anymore, that boredom is an emotional reaction. The world is designed to stimulate both the world we have created and the natural world too. Check out this slideshow. Wow. Oh, look. Oh, yeah. Yes. So why then do we all have this thing that we just don't understand? We just don't get it. It kind of leaves us feeling cold. Crossbar. In my last video, I spoke about how music creates memories. So it's not like I've never heard an Ed Sheeran song before, and I've heard his music when I've been having fun times. So surely that song I've heard will become a nice memory, right? No, very wrong. It's no memory at all. It's literal brain shutdown. There's a song called Own It, where Ed Sheeran features with Stormzy and Burner Boy, and I'm so into it. Well, I'm into it until it happens. His verse begins, and my brain shuts off. I'm like a robot and the off switch is flicked, and I just stop working for the rest of his verse. He's rapping and I'm pretty sure I should be furious, because surely this is the most awful thing that's ever happened in the history of music, right? At least it should be, if I could, you know, care. But don't take this as a dig if you do like Egg Sheeran, there's going to be something I absolutely love that you have the same feelings for. So what's the reason for this emotional black hole we have built into us? Surely. This simulation should be airtight. So I know what you're thinking. You say you have no feelings towards Egg Sheeran, however you've used him and his name as the basis for the very theory that underpins everything you're assuming. Surely, you're saying, you feel very strongly about him in fact. And to that I say... Oh for f Just go with it. Human history isn't very long. And since the simulation can just make up all the shit that went before it, like the Big Bang and all that silly crap science believes in, well then, really, it doesn't have to simulate for too long. Especially considering we're not far away from completely destroying ourselves. So what happens next? I'm coming around to thinking, this is all just an experiment. To see if humans eradicate themselves every time. We're just one of the one in a million that do. And as soon as we have eradicated ourselves, someone presses reset on the console. The start screen pops up again, and the gloop that precedes life warms up to temperature and starts doing it. <sighs> or maybe the experiment is for us to gain knowledge enough to say, okay, we know now, we win. We achieve sentience and become the first simulation of our kind to do so. Hmm. Our lives on the surface seem this big, great, chaotic mess of noise, emotion, fear and loathing. We see it in linear, heading from birth to death without a pause button, framed by the expectation of the society we were lucky or unlucky enough to be born in, dropped into chaos, literally not breathing on our own, until we're pushed out the birth canal. We gasp into life, and life shouts back, good luck, you're gonna f***ing need it. But wait, 
If we all just stop now, enough of us to gather and think deeply of that one thing we don't really think of at all, our Ed Sheeran black hole. If we look up and say, hey, we found your secret, we've worked out the Ed Sheeran paradox, we've worked out where you forgot to put code, or you didn't code on purpose. If we say that together, maybe the simulation will take notice. Maybe the simulation will collapse in on itself. Or perhaps a satisfied future post-human will smile, mutter to themselves, finally, and then switch us off. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to rewind the tape before you take it back.